this video, we're going to follow this line of reasoning. First, where does the Antichrist come from? What area of the world? And we're going to do the same for Gog of the land of Magog, because if the two are the same person, then the prophetic scriptures should show them coming from the same area. Why is that important? Because at this particular time where we live in, this close to the end of the age, the matter is not so much who the Antichrist will be, but where will he come from? The reason is if you're looking in the right place, then his identity will become apparent when it's the right time. Right now, we don't need to know that, but what we do need to know and what the scriptures abundantly tell us is where he comes from. Now, to trace the rise of the Antichrist, we need to go to Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, principally. These two visions show us a vision wherein the Antichrist is depicted as a little horn that rises up after ten horns or ten kings are already in place. So the two visions, when put together, will show us where the Antichrist is from. Now, to begin with, let's look at Daniel 7, because what we have here to set up the vision is that he's shown four kingdoms. The first three are depicted as a lion, which we now know is the kingdom of Babylon, which was succeeded by the bear, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, and then by the leopard, which was the Greek empire. So these three empires, Babylon, and then Persia, and the Medes, and then uh, the Greeks, uh, is a matter of history. But what Daniel does is something very unique and peculiar to end-time prophecy, but very common, and which you start here and then you leapfrog way into the future to our day and time to see a fourth beast in this particular vision that is composed of ten kings. And then there is a little horn that rises up after them. And this merges with and links well with uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation, so that we, when we see the link, when we see the bridge, we know that we are indeed looking at the end of this age. We have uh, taken a giant leap forward from history to now, to our present time, because we didn't need to know all that was in between. We just needed a setup to know where and what kingdoms are involved in the rise of the Antichrist. So here we're told enough to get enough information that when we then go to Daniel 8, it all fits. So if that's not too complicated, I hope. But this is what you do when you're a Berean. It's not just inspirational while well, you're just sitting there and going, wow, that's awesome. Instead, you're studying. It takes some time. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. So you have to pay attention. So Daniel 7, we're shown the rise of the little horn. How do we know that that's the Antichrist? Well, it's very simple because he is pictured here and it says this in verse 8, I was considering the horns. There was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. So we know the little horn comes up after the ten are already in place. But then it goes on to say that in this little horn were the eyes of a man, and here's the key thought, and a mouth speaking pompous words. And so he watches till uh, this beast is slain. He was watching because of the pompous words this little horn was saying, and he was given over to the burning flame. Uh, we know the Antichrist is eventually cast into the lake of fire. So here is a brief synopsis of the rise of the Antichrist, just enough information so that now we can go to Daniel 8 and put some more pieces together. So far, we know this is the Antichrist because it links now with Revelation 13. They see the same beasts, the dragon with the seven heads and the ten horns rising up in the book of Revelation chapter 13. It has uh, the mouth of a lion, 
It has the body of a leopard. It has the feet of a bear. So those are the kingdoms we were just introduced here in Daniel 7. But most importantly, Revelation 13 then says, a mouth was given over to the beast to speak blasphemous things against God and so forth. So that is enough to tell us that this little horn is the beast. This is the uh, symbolic uh, representation of the Antichrist that we need to trace and follow if we're going to learn um, what we need to know. There's a divine order to this. There is a, a purpose to this, not just a history lesson. We can go to history books for that, but we need to come to this book for key revelation as to what we need to see and know in this hour. So Daniel 7 establishes the truth that the little horn is the Antichrist. From there, we then go to Daniel 8. And what's important about this passage is we're going to see where he comes from. So to accomplish this, Daniel sees two kingdoms again. Only this time, just the ram and the goat, which represents the Medes and the Persians, and then the goat is Greece. So we get that interpretation. We don't have to guess. Um, verse 20 of Daniel 8, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. Of course, that's Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great, having conquered much of the known world, died quite unexpectedly. He died young. He had no sons. So what do you do with his kingdom? Well, they decided to divide his kingdom up between his four best generals. So this is depicted in verse 8, where we read, Therefore the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn, Alexander the Great, was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. That's what history records, the four generals. One was the king of the north, the king of the south, the king of the east, the king of the west. Um, verse 9 then tells us that out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great. And it goes on to explain and is a prophecy, a vision of this man of sin who is the king with fierce features who arises at the time of the end. Again, another leapfrog forward to our time. Skip, get right to the story. In other words, that's what the Holy Spirit does quite often. A child is born, a son is given, and the kingdom's upon his shoulder. Well, wait a minute. The son was given on a cross, and he died, and he was buried, and he rose from the dead, and then he left, and he comes back 2,000 years later. You skip, You condensed all of that? into Yeah, that's how end-time prophecy is. It's a very peculiar thing. But once you understand it, it makes perfect sense because the Holy Spirit is taking you right to the main points that you need to know. So in this case, what are we being shown? We're being shown that the little horn, which we identified as the Antichrist, will come from the area of the world that was occupied by the Greek Empire. More specifically, he will come from one of the four areas that was given to the four generals. Now, there's no doubt about this because this little horn, as you read on and in this vision, becomes the king of fierce countenance in which his power is mighty, but not by his own because he's empowered by Satan, by the devil. And he commits the transgression of desolation, wherein he comes against the sacrifices and a rebuilt Jewish temple and so forth. So we piece all of this together. But for now, it's just answering our question, where does he come from? And we now know from one of these four areas, he's either the king of the north, south, east, or west. And the beauty of this is that Daniel wanted to know more. And so as he prayed and fasted, eventually he was given the answer. 
And this answer is recorded in Daniel 11. So we're going from 7, Daniel 8, and now Daniel 11 to get the final piece. And that final piece is in Daniel 11, verse 36. Now, verse 36 seals the deal if you're wanting to know where the Antichrist comes from. Because this is the premier passage about the Antichrist. This is the one Paul used when he wrote 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The king will do according to his own will. He will exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped as God. He will stand in the temple and sit in the temple and declare that he's God and so forth. He's the man of sin. He's the uh, man of lawlessness. So why is that important? Because as you read the context here in Daniel 11, it becomes clear that this king is the king of the north. So now we can determine where the Antichrist comes from, where to look when it's time to look. We know that he will come from the area of the world that was occupied by the Greek Empire, more specifically by the area that was under the control of the king of the north. Now the question, final question, where is that on today's map? Well, it's the area of Asia Minor. By no coincidence, the same area where we see the seven letters to the seven churches. Or to put it simply, it's the area today we call Turkey. Now, is this the same area from which Gog of the land of Magog arises? Because if it is, then we have a positive ID that the two are the same. So let's take a look at that. Our observation of the Antichrist shows us that the Holy Spirit is not hiding anything from us. In fact, it's obvious that he wants us to know. He went to great lengths, giving visions and so forth to prophets so that we could know. Now, is it any different when we come to Gog? It shouldn't be because, as we now know, they are the same person. So we should see a direct match, not only in where Gog comes from, but also the allies of the Antichrist should match the allies of Gog. But let's look at Ezekiel 38 and identify where Gog comes from. And of course, Gog is just the way the Holy Spirit terms this Antichrist, man of sin, lawlessness, son of perdition, the beast, uh, the little horn, all of these titles and descriptions add to what we know about him. And Gog, that title is no different because it gives us the understanding that his power is not his, but that he has made a bargain with the devil, the same one that was offered to Jesus, if you remember, in Luke the gospel where Jesus was in the wilderness and he was taken up by the devil to a great and high mountain. And you know the story. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment and the glory of them. And then he said, if you will fall down and worship me, all of this is yours. I can give it to whomever I wish. Now, that authority, of course, was stolen or deceitfully so by uh, the devil from Adam, because we were initially created to be the gods of this world. But that was forfeited. Um, so the point is, the devil has the authority right now to give it to somebody. And that's what we see in the book of Revelation. In uh, Revelation chapter 13, it says, Verse 2, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Again, a direct link to Daniel's visions. But here's the key. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the title of Gog encapsulates this idea as Paul said in his second letter to the Thessalonians, the coming of this man of lawlessness is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Or as it says of him in Daniel chapter 8, the vision concerning the little horn who becomes the king with a fierce countenance 
and verse 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. So there we have the positive ID of this man of sin known as Gog, as well as all of his other titles. Now, when we trace the rise of Gog or ask the question, where does he come from? Again, the Holy Spirit has given us all the information we need to know. It's a positive ID because Ezekiel 38 begins by saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. So here he's saying that the land of Magog is where Gog comes from. That's his land. So the question has always been, where is that? Well, if you keep reading, it becomes clear because the Holy Spirit's not hiding anything from us. It was a mystery perhaps down through the ages, but when it's time for his mysteries, his secrets to be revealed, they belong to us and he will make sure that they are revealed. So here it's the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, that's a mistranslation, that's not correct. That's where we got messed up in the past. People saw Rosh and thought, hmm, that sounds like Russia. Yeah, that must be it. That's how much effort we put into this. But that's changed. We're no longer parrots parroting these misled thoughts, but we're now Bereans, and we're actually studying this out because it's time to know. So, it actually reads that Gog of the land of Magog is the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and so forth. Rosh is the Hebrew word that means chief. Rosh Hashanah, the chief or head of the year, the new year. So Rosh is a word that means he's the chief prince. Well, I guess so. He's empowered by Satan himself. So here... Gog, the chief prince of the land of Magog, of Meshach to Baal, and prophesy against him, I'm against you, the chief prince, and I will turn you around and so forth. And then verse 5, we get more areas of identification because it says Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with you. Well, those are also mentioned in the context of the Antichrist. But then verse 6, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma. So here we have these words and we're uh, like wondering where are these located? Where were they located and where are they now? And, you know, we've all probably studied this and seen the elaborate maps and so forth that take us to the descendants that went all over the world and so that tells you nothing because obviously the three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the whole world was repopulated through those three sons. So we don't need to know where all these sons and the peoples from them eventually migrated. That doesn't tell you anything. But what we need to know is where did these sons of Japheth, uh, where did they settle? Because that became their land. That became the land that was known as the land of Magog and so forth. So that comes from Genesis 10. And that's where a lot of these names come from. Because Genesis 10 says, verse 1, now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. I guess so, because we're all here because of that. And the sons of Japheth were Gomer. Well, that name's mentioned here. Magog, that name is mentioned in Ezekiel. And Madai, Javan, Tubal, that name's mentioned here. Meshach, that name's mentioned here. It goes on to say the sons of Gomer were, one of them is Togarma. And so we see that these names were really the sons and grandsons of Noah's son, Japheth. So Noah had three sons. Japheth was one of them. And a lot of these names were either the sons or grandsons of Japheth. So I'll put up 
on the screen for those who are watching and not just listening. Where are those known areas? Where did they settle? Not where they migrated eventually. We don't need to know that. We need to know where did they originally settle. And once again, we have a clear match with the Antichrist because we see that it's the area of Asia Minor, the area of Turkey, and even stretching out to the east a bit. In other words, it's an area that's below the Black Sea, by the Caspian Sea. It's in the Middle East. It's not the area north of the Black Sea. It's not Ukraine. It's not Russia. And we could continue on with this line of reasoning. It's not anywhere else in the world other than the area of Asia Minor and this Middle East area that comprises the allies of both Antichrist and Gog. So in conclusion, what does this mean to us living here today, 2024? Well, it means we should be looking only to the area of the world that is associated with the land of Turkey. That's where he's going to rise. He's going to rise as a little horn, as a matter of fact. So an insignificant beginning after 10 kings are already in place. So if you're looking for the Antichrist or Gog from any other area of the world, you're going to miss it. You're looking in the wrong place. Now, this is why it's important to study as a Berean, particularly in our hour where there is increased light and knowledge because we're so close to the end, so that now we can look at things and more opens up to us. For instance, the question was, what about Russia? We were taught that Russia was Gog, and now we know that's not true. So what about Russia? How do you know for sure? Well, one final point becomes very clear when we look at Daniel again, chapter 11, and we saw the king of the north. We saw that he was the Antichrist. So by extension, we're also looking at Gog of Magog, right? The two are the same. So verse 45 tells us the end of the Antichrist, the end of Gog. And it says that he shall plant the tents of his palace or headquarters between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Well, between the seas is in southern Israel with your face towards the Dead Sea and your back towards the Mediterranean Sea. We covered that in the last video. And here it says... He will plant his headquarters there, but he will come to his end and no one will help him. Now back up a verse, verse 44, and you're now getting a glimpse into this war that spans, as we now know, three and a half years. But at some point in this three and one half year war, it seems that there is another factor going on because Verse 44 says, news from the east and news from the north shall trouble him. Him is the Antichrist, Gog of Magog. So what is this news that's coming from the north and from the east? It's not glad news. It's not more reinforcements coming to his aid. Instead, this news troubles him. And it says that he goes forth with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. So ask the question, if Gog and the Antichrist are in control of Turkey, Asia Minor, and this whole Middle Eastern theater, then who's north of that? What is this news that troubles him that comes from the north? Well, if you go north of the Black Sea, now you're into Russia, Ukraine. If you go to the east, you'll see the kings of the east. That would be China. Now, what nations are coming into alignment together right now? Well, we see Russia is forming alliances with China and North Korea. Isn't that interesting? We're watching Bible prophecy formulate the players taking their appropriate places on the stage. So apparently, 
What we can gather from this is that the Antichrist, Gog of Magog, does not control the whole world. This is not, it never becomes a one world government because he still has enemies and adversaries. Not even looking at other parts of the world, just north of him in Russia. This news troubles him and China is coming. Apparently, this is what we see in the book of Revelation with the sixth trumpet and the sixth bowl where the Euphrates River dries up to make way for the kings of the east. This is troubling news. And so he goes forth, the Antichrist, with great fury and great annihilation. This, to me, looks like World War III. Now, the question could be raised, well, then, what about America? Where are we in this end time scenario? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? In regards to that, I did some research on the internet a number of years ago. I was researching the worldwide population of Jewish people and where they lived, where they had been scattered to. I found that 40%, according to the internet, already lived in the land of Israel. Another 40% lived in the United States, particularly in the Northeast. Together, that accounts for 80% of the worldwide Jewish population. So apparently the other 20% are scattered in other various nations. What does that have to do with this question of where America is in end time prophecy? Well, one answer might be found in Jeremiah chapter 30. Now the context of Jeremiah 30 is that it is the day of the Lord and their dreams of peace and security are suddenly shattered by the invasion of who we now would call the Antichrist or Gog of Magog. And yet there is a promise, even though they are in desperate situations, the promise is that the Lord will break his yoke from their neck and burst his bonds, and that foreigners would no longer enslave them but they would serve the Lord their God and David their king instead. So this means, putting it in context, that the nation of Israel, facing their most desperate moment in their nation's history, as the heavens part, as Jesus comes, as his church is taken with him to heaven, but on the way he splits the mountain, the Mount of Olives, to provide a way of escape. It is then that they become the recipients of this great promise in Hosea 6 of a third day revival, which is why we find them crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, they are now believers on Jesus, the Messiah. So verse 11 is significant to our question because the Lord promises them I am with you, says the Lord. I'm with you to save you. And though I make a full end of all nations where I've scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you, although I will correct you in justice. My point is, it sounds to me like where America stands in prophecy is right here. A full end to those nations to which they were scattered. Because after all, if any nation qualifies for what is written here in verse 11, it would be America. So the truth is, America will not be coming to Israel's rescue in their most critical time of need. Instead, Jesus will. Together with his raptured, completed church, taken to heaven with him, and seated as his heavenly Esther, for just such a time as this.